right, everybody, we are here uh, at Calvary Chapel Palace Verde sitting down for a conversation with Pastor Rob and Pastor Ben Kai, and this is Pastor Daniel here, and we've been going through the book of Exodus in our devotions, and every once in a while we will uh, come together in our little podcast room here and do a recording, and today we're talking about the plagues that God brought upon Egypt in Exodus chapter 7 through 11. Uh, These 10 plagues were uh, judgment that God brought um, to Egypt because Pharaoh would not let the people go out of Egypt and back into Israel. So um, here we are. You guys ready for this? Absolutely. All right. So um, Right off the bat, what we see is that Pharaoh, you know, refused to respond to God's plan, which was to bring Israel out of slavery and into redemption. So that's the big theme, right, of Exodus is God bringing his people out of slavery and into um, liberty, into redemption. Why were they in slavery in the first place? Yeah. It's a great uh, question. Um, part of it was just God's plan, right? He had said that they were going. He was going to give Abraham and his children the land, but he told them, "You'll be your people will be enslaved four hundred and thirty years uh, while we fulfill the wickedness of the Canaanites." Mm. Um, and so there's a story there of God's grace and His willingness to give the Canaanites time, uh, even to repent, and they clearly don't do so, and instead. Uh, you know, so God's going to bring judgment on the Egyptians and ultimately on the Canaanites. <laughs> well, and the, their slavery in Egypt is also a, a picture of our slavery to sin. And mm-hmm. so having experienced that, the then being set free from it um, has all that much more meaning to it, if you think about it. Yeah, so Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob or Israel, and he had risen to prominence under the prior Pharaoh and then uh, a later Pharaoh it says in the beginning of Exodus that um, he didn't remember, didn't know Joseph. And so the people had been brought into bitter slavery. They were making, you know, quotas of bricks each and every uh, day to build all of the wonderful feats that the Egyptians built. Um, But it was slavery. And like you said, Rob, it's a picture of sin. And God is always seeking to bring us out of sin and into his redemption. And so uh, God raised up... um, the man Moses, even in the beginning of chapter 7, he says, I will make you as God to the people. What does that mean? <laughs> Was Moses God? Definitely uh, not a God, but uh, with the power of God. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what a wonderful, beautiful lesson for us, right, as we are to stand, yeah. um, not in our own strength and ability and not in, uh, you know, Moses says, man, I can't even talk. I'm, I'm a mumbler and a stumbler. And God says, that's okay. Uh, well, and he's a reflection of God, much like Jesus says, I am the light of the world, but yet he tells us we are the light of the world. We're only the light of the world as we reflect right. his light, Yeah, kind yeah. of like the moon reflecting the light of the sun. And Moses certainly did glow later on <laughs> in his time from being in God's presence. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I saw this quote from D.L. Moody. He said that the 40 years that Moses initially spent in Pharaoh's court thinking he was somebody... And then 40 years in the desert learning he was nobody and 40 years showing what God can do with somebody who found out he was a nobody. <laughs> That's great. Amen. So That's um, fabulous. Moses and Aaron are 80 years old when they uh, go about this whole uh, assignment of telling Pharaoh to let my people go. And so uh, they show up uh, to Pharaoh one day and... Uh, to perform a miracle, God had given them this sort of miraculous staff that Aaron carried with him. And when he threw it on the ground, what happened? It became serpents. It became a serpent, right? And so then Pharaoh comes along and says, you know, bring my magicians in. They can do the same thing. And interestingly, they do. They're able to replicate the miracle. They throw down their staves and you've got now all these snakes on the ground or uh, the word is actually in Hebrew. It could be something more of like a, a a sea monster. Some people think that it was like crocodiles or something. In fact, because a crocodile was the symbol of Pharaoh. So maybe you've got these crocodiles on the ground or whatever. But there's sort of this initial showdown between Pharaoh and Moses and Aaron. And uh, Rob, what do we see happen? Well, it, 
Well, but before that, though, it just it gives it's a reminder of Satan being the great deceiver. He always tries to give us a cheap imitation of what God can offer. And That's we, right. We see Pharaoh doing that here through his um, uh, magicians. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. So yeah, there's a battle between um, light and darkness, good versus evil, the God of Israel Yahweh versus the gods of Egypt, and. Uh, but what happens is the the staff of Aaron ends up eating the staffs of the magicians, showing really a prophetic sign of what was going to happen in this story, which is God's going to win. Absolutely. And this is all a full picture of how God is going to show um, his ultimate victorious redemption that we have promised in Jesus Christ. Um, you even made mention earlier, Ben Kai, when we were talking about how um, Satan was represented as a serpent in the garden. And um, even the staff, um, when they were bit by serpents, what did they do? They raised up the they bronze up serpent the in the wilderness. Right. Um, so you can say that that's representative of Christ. So so that's sort of the initial thing. And then you've got these 10 plagues that happen uh, from chapter 7 through chapter 11. Um, the Nile turns to blood. The, there's a frog infestation. You've got gnats and flies. Their livestock dies. Boils. Uh, just that word. I hate that word, boils. It, it's just nasty. <laughs> um, they have this crazy hailstorm that, you know, took life um, from their livestock as well. Locust, uh, darkness came upon the earth. And then the final judgment, which is the uh, greatest of them all, which was the death of the firstborn. And that's where what follows is Passover. So what do you guys think about these 10 plagues that came upon Egypt? Can I give a quick plug before we yeah. do the CCPV? I, I have to do this because I have to tell you one of the things that I love about this discussion is um, people like to skip over God's judgment. It's mm. an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people, <laughs> yeah. but it's a necessary topic, right? Without judgment, is, there's no appreciation for the grace that comes to Jesus Christ. And so th I just think it's important that we're even... yeah doing this um, because a lot of people are uncomfortable with this picture of who God is. Yeah. But this is God, yeah. and he is, his judgment is necessary because he's holy. Amen. Um, so I'm sorry. And also, without judgment, we would have no hope that all the wrongs of this world will someday somehow be yeah, righted. Right. I mean, and everyone, yeah. everyone has that hope innately in them that somehow wrongs will be righted. But if God is not a God who judges sin, then we would not have that hope. You know? Yeah, and Rob, you made a great point in your sermon on Sunday saying from, uh, you used how Blaise Pascal said, um, mm. we need to know the blackness, the wretchedness Amen. of our sin, right. but also the wonderful joy of our salvation in yeah. Jesus Christ and hold those two in tension because right. you're not going to really discover the joy of salvation until you discover what you've been saved from. Right. And uh, we've been saved from the judgment of God. Amen. Yeah. 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 The scriptures say we have escaped <laughs> judgment through Jesus Christ, yeah. like he's our escape. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, water turned to blood. Yeah. I'm so thankful we have Jesus who his first miracle was turning water to wine. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it was you tastier know. than what the uh, yeah. Egyptians accounted, right? So they're, <laughs> they're digging through trying to find water to drink. Then they got an infestation of frogs. frogs. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, the, the gnats, I've read commentaries that think that those were mosquitoes. And for some reason, we've had some mosquitoes in our house this last mm. week. And I tell you guys, one mosquito bite. I'm like, I'm a mess. Like, I I feel like mosquitoes, mosquito bites are from the pit of hell. <laughs> uh, and if you ever experience an infestation of them where they just hover around you, it is miserable yeah. in and of itself yeah. before you get bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm from a tropical country. We suffer from a lot of mosquitoes and malaria and all that comes with it. And yeah. man, it is miserable yeah. uh, when they're swarming you. I mean, you, know. you asked what we thought of the plagues. I mean, they seem to grow in severity mm -hmm. as they go. They also seem to each strike at the heart of something that was core to Egypt. I mean, the Nile is why Egypt became a great nation because it enabled commerce and agriculture mm -hmm. and all the rest of those things. And God goes after that right away, turning it to, to blood. And every little thing he goes after was something about their culture that would made them feel they were something. 
you know. Yeah, and it, it was ultimately also going against the false gods that they worshipped. Yep. Um, the first commandment of sure. the Ten Commandments that God gave to his people was, there shall be no other gods before me, right? And right. so um, these Egyptians had put other gods in place. Um, for instance, the god Osiris, uh, they believed that the Nile was his bloodstream. Mm. And so mm. he's like, oh turn this thing actually into <laughs> actual blood, blood, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then you've got, so every plague, you could connect it to some various Egyptian god, mm -hmm. um, which is just a way, even as it says in Exodus 12, 12, God was executing judgment against all the gods of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So explicitly mm -hmm. says that in his word. Now, are these gods real gods? No, clearly not. And clearly. God's proving that yeah. and making it clear. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the, the difficult part, right? Is God's trying to open them eye, their eyes to the true God. Yeah. And still they don't repent. Yeah. Uh, but there clearly is some element of power behind these false gods, right? Because they're able to bring the magicians and turn these staffs into serpents. So what is that right. power? What is the power behind lowercase g gods? Well, that's what I was, was going to say was, um, yes, they're not real gods, but any false god, which is an idol, only has as much power as you're willing to give it mm. over yourself. And that's what they had done. They had they had conveyed a lot of power on, in, on these gods because mm -hmm. they worshipped them. <laughs> so yeah. the, yeah. the gods had no power in and of themselves. It was just like our our habits, our addictions. They only have as much power as we give them. Yeah. Um, and so that's what happened. Yeah, but we are aware that God also gives Satan some power yes. in order to lead people into deception when their hearts are hardened, as Pharaoh's heart was. Yeah. Um, and clearly there's some sense of that here, right? Uh, sure. Giving him the ability to replicate to a point. I with, mean, you get to that limits point. limits on it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where it says he they could no longer replicate what God was doing. Right. Um, I believe, especially with the third, the sixth, and I think the ninth, it was made clear that they couldn't do that. But um, there, some God gives some allowance to the forces of darkness you know? mm, definitely so, yeah so you see these judgments come and like you made a note of rob is that they seem to grow in severity which shows that god in his judgments is merciful Mercy. well can you give us a definition of mercy rob well Ellis? yeah mercy is is not getting what you do deserve whereas grace is getting that which you don't deserve yeah that's basically how it's looked at so mercy is really just god withholding judgment sure. yep it and, shows his patience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I also think it's really interesting, though, that as, because your description is right, that it increases in severity. But the one before death is darkness. It's the absence of light. Mm. And to think that that is uh, an extreme form, right? I mean, God is light. And his absence is an ultimate form of judgment that those who will not submit to him will experience. It's why hell is called outer darkness. Mm -hmm. All right. And a worm that never dies. <laughs> that, yeah, that doesn't sound too good. Unpleasant either. picture. Yeah. Even what you see, the connection later on in Revelation is the judgments that will come in the tribulation period. Um, you know, these are judgments that, um, you know, are connected in that way. So, but one of the most thought-provoking things about all of this, of what we see in the plagues coming upon uh, Egypt, is the condition of Pharaoh's heart. And, you know, God gave plenty of opportunity for Pharaoh to respond to the commands of letting the Israelites go, but he continued to refuse to listen to God. But there's a lot of theological conversation to be had around the hardening of Pharaoh's heart because you see God make these statements where it, it seems as though, okay, God's the one hardening Pharaoh's heart. But then you see also scripture saying Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And so you've got this great theological tension, which can simultaneously exist, which is that God is sovereign and man yeah. is responsible. And it's one of the most, you know, uh, pertinent examples of scripture where both of those can exist. And I think what we can't ever fully reconcile those two, this side of heaven, but one, one way to help close the gap in my mind at least is god eventually gave in his sovereignty gave pharaoh what pharaoh wanted that's right i mean that's what happened pharaoh wanted a heart and heart god said i'll give you a heart and heart pharaoh wanted mm -hmm. to live 
apart from God in darkness. And God said, let there be darkness. You can live apart from me. And Romans 1 talks about that and that, you know, that descending order of, of the fall of, of civilization. Just turning that to read, absolutely. He gave over gave to a over. base mind. Yeah. That's right. To do what they already right. desired to do. Yeah. That's ultimately his judgment. You want to live apart from me? Fine. Go live apart from me. You know, absolutely. Is what he'll yeah, and that you know, I, I in reading some of uh, the commentaries on this also, I wouldn't want to diminish from the strong hand and the strong part that God played right. in that, right. um, as part of His ultimate plan. You know that uh, Pharaoh was being used as a tool uh, for God to ultimately shine His glory through in the redemption of His people. That's what uh, Paul says in Romans yeah, nine. Exactly. exactly. If I could read that scripture from chapter nine, verse sixteen and seventeen, God says, "But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go." So, he raised him up as Pharaoh to show yep. his own power. So God brought these judgments ultimately for His own glory. Absolutely. And think about it. I mean, you know, look, we can look back in history and see when God says he raised him up. We understand the power of Pharaoh at this time. It was immense. <laughs> he was God to the Egyptians. That's right. God wasn't knocking down some pawn. <laughs> yeah. And so God had given him great power and wealth uh, and ability and magicians at his side. Um, and, you know, one of these things where you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, right? Not everything that glitters yeah. is gold. and. <laughs> God was using it for his purpose, yeah. ultimately. So we see God's mercy even toward Pharaoh. One of the things I took notice of is that when he brought the warnings, when Moses brought the warnings to Pharaoh, it says he came in the morning and immediately my mind went to uh, that God's mercies are new each morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, But after repeated warnings, uh, Pharaoh seemed to continue to head in the... Uh, that place of hardness. He kept saying things like, tomorrow I will yeah. let the people go. When, what does God say in his word about salvation? Today, today is the day of day salvation. Today, today is the day of salvation. And Pharaoh saw that there was respite, it says, and he hardened his heart. A lot of times when, you know, okay, when things are going bad, then I'll turn to God. Oh, things are going good. And there's kind of a little, you know, respite here. Then I'll harden my heart again to the Lord. Um, it's also a beautiful reminder of if, if you hear God speaking to you, don't delay in your response. <laughs> and yeah. we, we encourage people that every time we have an altar call, but it's That's not a good idea to, to delay because usually you're going to get more resistant to his call when you delay. Yeah, absolutely. So he wanted to delay. Another thing he tried to do was to compromise. He said, go, you guys can sacrifice mm. within the land. But I love how Moses responded. He says, we will sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. Amen. That's really good. True worship, right? Yeah. It's not as defined by man, but as defined by God. That's right. Yeah. So Pharaoh repeatedly makes numerous confessions um, in chapter 9, verse 27, chapter 9, verse 34, chapter 10, verse 16 through 17. He sees, you know, saying, I've sinned and, and this calamity that's, you know, stop it. Please go pray to your God that he'll stop this. And Moses does. He goes to God and he asks for the Lord to, you know, remove the plague. And what does God do? He does. He takes away the plague. And then even still, uh, the, the Pharaoh hardens his heart toward the Lord. And it's interesting that, you know, when God shows acts of mercy upon people, sometimes people's response to his mercy is greater hardness because mm -hmm. they, they love the rest. They love the rest of it. They love when yeah. things are going well. And the only time they'll ever turn to him is when things are going bad. Don't you think also, though, Pharaoh's confession was confession without repentance? Yeah. And I mean, any bad guy in the back of a cop car, you know, is going to, he will we'll confess and is sorry, but not to the point of change. And that's really what, as we were talking about earlier today, repentance is change, you know, it, it's a change, it's a, it leads to a change of behavior is, is what absolutely. true repentance does. And Pharaoh wasn't about to do that. I mean, he would. And, and it is absolutely, it leads to a, a change in behavior, but also because um, you stop being sorry for the results of your actions and you're sorry because of the one you've offended. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. That's when true repentance will, will come in because you don't want to hurt 
your loved one any longer rather than just, oh, it keeps rebounding on me, mm. you know? That's good. Yeah, well, any other overall thoughts that you see throughout this uh, section? I mean, there's so much we could take away. We <laughs> yeah. could talk, talk a lot longer Well, I think it. the judgments are brought by God with the intent to, uh, and the hope that it would bring about repentance. I mean, that's yeah. why there's the delays, and he does the yeah. same thing in Revelation. I mean, it's not, his judgment is not necessarily quick here. I mean, he yeah. takes his time and increases the severity of it, pausing every step of the way, hoping there would be repentance. Yeah, because Ezekiel says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Right. Um, and, and if God does take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and he's showing abundance of mercy and patience in order for people to come to repentance um, so that he could bring about his wonderful redemption in our lives, that's what this story is all pointing us to, is the greatest yeah. story of redemption ever told. And so, uh, Benka, you want to bring us home with uh, the good news? Amen. I mean, there's lots of good news. Obviously, this is going to end in chapter 12 with the Passover, which is a reminder um, of our Savior who is going to pay the price for our sins. And that was certainly one of the pictures that this left me with, is, is in you know getting a picture of the judgment of God and recognizing that um, Jesus took all of that judgment for all of the sins of the world on the cross so that we would not have to bear it, so we would not have to go through any of this, particularly the darkness and death mm. that is the wages of sin. Um, and Jesus bore that on behalf of all of us. Uh, yeah. And then we are cleansed by his blood. I mean, that's the good news. That's the good news. <laughs> you know, and to follow up on that, a lot of times as Christians, we, we don't really think about what we were saved from. Mm. We think, oh, I got saved from a destructive lifestyle, or I got saved from, you know, I was headed off to jail or whatever. But Romans 5, 9 is real clear. We got saved from this very same thing we're seeing here, the wrath of God. And that's why we should be so grateful for it. Yeah. You know. There's been a transfer from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. Amen. We've come from 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 darkness to light. You've come from evil to good, <laughs> from Absolutely. from gods even just being your own god to the god of heaven and earth but the reminder of the cost of that because he is faithful and just to forgive us mm. because somebody paid that price that's right somebody bore that judgment yeah. um it was paid just not by us <laughs> yeah so well excited to keep going through uh, the book of exodus and our devotions and and also uh, enjoy these round table discussions we'll Amen. come to one uh in a couple of weeks as well. So, Amen. Um, thanks. Yeah. God bless you. Thanks for listening.